Uh, I'd like to also uh, give you some, uh, an idea of how rife arpeggiation was in the 19th century. There are some really great quotes here. In 1877, the pianist Ernst Power, who worked in England, criticised the modern tendency, called it the modern tendency, in which, quote, the broken or arpeggio manner has become so generally diffused that some performers seem to consider firm chords altogether, altogether obsolete. And some 30 years earlier, Carl Cherney made an almost identical remark, and he says, quote, in the modern style, many pianists have almost forgotten how to strike firm chords with all the notes of each chord exactly together. So there's an indication there that during the 19th century, arpeggio playing was the norm, almost. And there are many other quotes I could give you uh, that, that, that confirm this. Of particular interest, and I always find this really fascinating, is the advice of a, a little-known uh, uh, pedagogue, Philip Corrie, in England in 1810. And he says that, quote, when the words con espressione, with ex expression, con anima, or dolce, and other words like that, are marked of a passage, it signifies that the appoggiando must be particularly and often used and made as long as possible. Quite clearly, in 1810, for him, these terms indicated that arpeggiation must be applied frequently and noticeably whenever you came across these words. Um, this is particularly significant in light of the fact that such terms no longer carry this meaning. When, when we play for you later, whenever I see these, these types of words, I do consider using arpeggiation to, to some extent or other. Early recordings confirmed that unnotated arpeggiation was made in several ways uh, and speeds, with placements before and with the beat to achieve a variety of effects. And as I say, I'll be, using, I'll, I'll be demonstrating that uh, as we go along today. Finally, one uh, very interesting uh, notational quirk for several generations of 19th century pianists, arpeggio playing appears to have been implicit when the chords were marked with slurred staccato, or what we call portato, so you've got the dots and then the slur. This meaning was promulgated by the virtuoso pianist Moscheles, who explained in 1827 that, quote, when dots are used with slurs over double notes and chords, these should be struck very slightly in the arpeggio manner giving them the same length as of time as a dot under a slur requires. I'm definitely going to adopt this in, in my playing with Brahms. I, I think it's, it's very suitable and um, very hard in piano playing to understand why composers wrote these uh, portato marks. They don't really make that much sense on the modern piano. They were very suited, of course, to the clavichord and, and the sign probably comes from, from there. I'd like to now play you a fascinating example um, of Karl Reinecke. I mentioned uh, he was a very famous pianist in his time. He was at one time uh, uh, director of the Leipzig Conservatory. Uh, he knew Mendelssohn. He knew Schumann. Schumann absolutely loved his playing. Actually, said that he was one of the few pianists who understood his music. Liszt was so impressed with his legato lyrical touch that he had him teach his own daughter. And Reinecke taught many people at the Leipzig Conservatory, including Grieg and various others. Luckily, towards the end of his life, uh, again at the turn of the 20th century, he recorded his own arrangement of the Larghetto, the slow movement, from Mozart's Piano Concerto K537. Um, this is, he, he loved playing Mozart's pieces on his own, so he put in the orchestral tutties and the solo parts, um, make quite a big piece. Uh, in this, I actually have the edition that he produced of this work, and I haven't got it to show you today, we don't have a PowerPoint facility here, but um, I can tell you that there, what you will hear is most of it is not marked in the music. I'll leave it at that and you can make up your own marks.
hard to make out one from the other, but if you listen time and time again, you can. The other thing that's fascinating about this playing is that he seems to be using uh, techniques, expressive techniques such as notes in a gal, playing things in a slightly lilting fashion that we expect to hear in, in say, Baroque performance practice, but we wouldn't necessarily uh, use for Mozart, uh, and we wouldn't expect a romantic pianist to be using, but in fact, he is doing that. Even, he even back dots, he, he makes Lombardic rhythms, da 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 da, that sort of jerky sort of style. And that's not the fault of the recording apparatus, because as the piece progresses, he keeps doing it over and over again. So I don't think it's actually uh, that much of the fault, it's what he wants to do. In Brahms, is there a tempo modification that's clearly of central importance in delineating musical structure and character? And early recordings show that a faster tempo was taken immediately, or an accelerando was made um, in several instance, instances, uh, particularly during repeated material, so often um, either a repeated motor or a da capo, or a repeat of a section, during increased harmonic tension, that's particularly um, harmony centered around the dominant, rising tessitura, that is the rising pitch, so as Perhaps a phrase gets higher, the tempo may get faster. Um, and as a passage may get louder, the tempo may also get faster with the crescendo. Slower tempos often enhance a more expressive or melodic section. Um, especially if that occurred within a faster movement, they might take a significantly slower tempo. And often the second subject in a sonata form movement was played slower. A pronounced continuity, that is the gradual slowing down, were often made um, at cadential points, particularly at the ends of sections, during a passage of lower or falling tessitura pitch, during a relaxation of harmonic tension or with a decrease in the dynamic level. Um, and in many recordings, such modifications often occur frequently and really sound extreme compared to what we're used to in modern performance. Um, there's a lot of significant evidence for the use of tempo modification of Brahms' music, and I won't go into too much detail, but a fascinating um, piece of evidence exists of uh, annotated scores made by Fanny Davies, who was a pupil of Clara Schumann and um, a very close associate of Brahms and even Joachim. And she observed um, one day a rehearsal of Brahms, Joachim and the cellist Hausmann, which occurred in 1887. And she had the score on her lap, and um, she took down, or noted down, the metronome markings for all of the different sections in the B major piano trio, um, that's opus 8, and the C minor piano trio, uh, trio opus 101. Then after the rehearsal, she uh, accosted Joachim and checked these metronome markings with him to, to see if they were indeed accurate, and he agreed they were. And um, I sort of in my research, drawn up a chart comparing these metronome markings with um, many, many other recordings from the uh, 20th century. And although I can't show you that table now, those metronome markings certainly are uh, evidence far more extreme tempo modification that's used in any of the other recordings I've managed to source. Also interesting are uh, similar tempo modifications made by old ensembles, these old, uh, particularly German string quartets that I've listened to, playing the same repertoire. And a very fascinating example exists in Beethoven's Opus 131, where both the Gewandhaus and Rosé quartets change the tempo um, within a large section in exactly the same way. They both do the same accelerando, the same um, ritenuto as well within the section, and it's, it's a very large section, so it's quite significant they would both end up playing uh, very similar tempos, but also similar modifications. What this really tells us is that this tempo modification was carried out coherently in order, it seems, to delineate significant structural points. And it also strongly suggests that these modifications were often planned and rehearsed Otherwise, it would be very difficult in an ensemble such as this um, to do it sort of ad libitum in the spur of the moment and to execute it sort of in a successful way. Of course, smaller fluctuations of tempo, so sort of surges, if you like, within a phrase, um, agogic accents, or that, that is when you lengthen a particular note, um, 
and the like were very probably spontaneous. Um, there may be some of those spontaneous moments tonight as well. Yet, often um, in recordings, these particular moments don't appear in the initial statement of themes. They often only appear um, in the repeat of a theme, or um, perhaps in a de capo section. And that again tells us that perhaps they were more planned um, than we, we might think. And also that these modifications were used to create uh, interest in variety in melodic material. Um, so you will hear a lot of tempo fluctuation in our performance, particularly during crescendi and all of these situations I've just um, explained. Some examples I'd like to play you. Um, I think this is in the right order. The, the, the first example is, uh, again, the Brunopost Quartet playing the Hofsetter string quartet over 3 number 5. This is attributed to Haydn. And um, this is a recording from 19... 25. The reason I've chosen to play you this is because um, the first violin has a solo over a pizzicato accompaniment, and that plucked accompaniment is a great indication um, just of how, um, how fluctuative the, the underlying pulse actually is. You can really hear, hear it very clearly. Thank <laughs> you. 